Well, 7.30 guys, probably time to kick this into gear. Uh, so, um, good evening everybody, hope you're keeping well and safe. My name is Ken Winter, I'm a Technical Support Manager for Grain Corp, and I'm based out of the Waikato. So, just a couple of tips before we get started. Hopefully at the bottom of your screen, you can see a toolbar, and on that toolbar is a Q&A tab. So anywhere through this presentation, if you um, want something clarified or have a question, please don't hesitate to type that in. We will endeavour to answer any questions as we go through, but um, don't panic if we don't. We'll definitely get the information to you later on. So look, tonight to kick this off, um, it's going to be myself and Alan Faulkner presenting. The topics for tonight are what's in the transition period and why is it so important? Looking at the benefits and the return on investment of implementing successful transition feeding and the different transition man management options for different farm styles. So look, it's my pleasure to introduce to you tonight, um, Alan Faulkner, he's a National Technical Manager for Nutritech. He's a very experienced nutritionist and very well respected right around New Zealand. And Nutritech itself is, is a company that we have um, been very proud to be involved with. They've got great products. Those products very much complement what we do. They have great technical, technical support and backup. So um, without any further ado, I'll hand you over to Alan. Welcome, Alan Faulkner. He's got us on moot. Where are we, Alan? You're not there. This might have a little technical issue here until Alan comes on board, bear with us. All right, so um, can you see me? You probably can't, for some reason I can't get my video on, Ken. Oh, okay, <laughs> maybe Anne's gonna have a look at that. I'll um, let her work on in the meantime. In the meantime, um, sorry to not see your beautiful face, Alan, but we'll just proceed as per normal. All yeah. right, there we go, it's all good. All right, uh, thanks very much uh, all of you out there um, and thanks for uh, joining us on this uh, evening tonight to talk a little bit about transition feeding. Um, I guess we have a very good relationship with GrainCorp and um, you know it's around this uh, technical support offering that we can provide. So without further ado, I will talk a little bit about uh, transition feeding uh, this evening. Right, so if we talk about the transition period, we are generally talking about this period round calving. And this is what we term as the, I guess the three to four weeks pre-calving and the three to four weeks post-calving. In this time, as we can see the black line on your graph is the, is the body weight and body weight uh, generally is static or dropping even before calving. Uh, this would be the loss of the fetus, but actually body weight drops uh, very quickly after calving. And what we have at this time is milk production is increasing uh, at a very rapid rate and feed intake starts reducing just pre-carving and actually has a bit of a lag before it catches up with the milk production. And this is what is called a negative energy balance. And so it's something that we've got to be very aware of around carving. So a lot of my focus today is gonna to talk about what can we do to try and minimize the impacts of some of these issues that happen in this period. So if we look at our objectives, what are we trying to achieve in this period? One of the key ones is trying to get the rumen microbes adapted to the new feeds they're going to, going to uh, get post-carving. So the rumen microbes are really the bugs in the rumen that, that generate nearly 80% of the energy for the cow. So while the cow is doing some of it, the actual bugs in the rumen are doing most of this work. And as a result of that, we really want to promote this energy intake and feed intake post carving. And as I've talked about earlier on, the feed intake starts lagging uh, in this period. And we really want to be promoting feed intake. And a lot of that is related to the rumen microbes. The other part is the immune system. Now we know the immune system is um, compromised at carving. And I'll talk a little bit about that in some future slides. The other big one to talk about in this period is, is the metabolic fever. Uh, and this is uh, particularly with things like milk fever that can relate to things like ketosis as well. 
And actually, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is improve the subsequent productivity, and that might be milk production and fertility, perhaps even body condition score. But try and, that's the end result for us uh, and the end result for the farmer. So some work done by Dairy NZ in 2012 showed that 80% of the disease costs that we get on farm, on dairy farms particularly, is generated in this four weeks pre-calving and four weeks post-calving. And 4% of these animals are involuntary culled from the herd as a result of this. Now, I've given this statement in many presentations with many vets in the audience, and I've never really had anybody disagree with that, uh, with that statement. So. Um, it's a very important period for us. Now, the transition period really represents a, a huge opportunity for us. We're talking about the three weeks pre, three to four weeks pre carving and three to four weeks post carving to have a huge impact on the subsequent cow health, the milk production, and the subsequent reproductive performance, not only for this lactation, but actually for the next lactation as well. So, at the end of the day, it's a big opportunity for us to make a big difference. So if we talk about rumen microbes, and I'm going to talk here a little bit about rumen adaptation. So how do we get these papillae in the rumen adapted to this new uh, environment they're soon going to get? So on the left-hand side on your screen is, is what the inside inner in wall of the rumen looks like. The, these are those rumen papillae. It looks like a, a very flat carpet. And what we're trying to achieve in this period is trying to actually get these rumen papillae looking like this, which is... Um, uh, much larger papillae and more branched and it's these papillae where we get the absorption surface area for the volatile fatty acids that are produced by the rumen microbes and it's this that's going to generate that energy intake uh, post carving so in general rumen microbial populations take about 10 days to adapt to the to the new feedstuffs that go into the rumen but the rumen papillae take about four to six weeks which is why it's very important for us to get these papillae developed uh, in this period, transition period, pre-carving. Right, so this gives us a chance to introduce some of these ingredients that they're gonna be getting post-carving. So that could be uh, some of the starches like uh, wheat, barley or maize, uh, some of the sugars like molasses, starting to introduce some of those ingredients into the transition diet in these three to four weeks pre-carving. It also gives us a very unique opportunity to start implementing rumen modifiers. So these are technologies that have been available to us in the, in the nutritional world to try and modify these bugs in the rumen and, and uh, allow the good bugs to proliferate. One of these is like ionophores. So an example would be rumensin. Uh, that really uh, promotes um, some of the propionate producing bacteria in the rumen. And then we've got live yeast. An example would be Levicel SC that is around promoting some of the fiber digesting bacteria in the rumen and scavenging oxygen and keeping that rumen in a very anaerobic environment which is what those bugs enjoy. Right so if we move on away from the rumen onto immunity and as I've said before this immunity is very much compromised pre-carving. If we see from this research work it shows that uh, the lymphocyte function and the neutrophil function in those uh, three three to four weeks pre-carving really drops. And uh, this is just evidence that this is gonna occur in these, in these cows at this time. And a lot of this is down to what we call oxidative stress. Now, many of us might have heard about this in, in human nutrition where we talk about antioxidants. But generally what happens at this time is, is the cells are working really, really hard. And uh, as a result, they produce these, uh, what we call free radicals or reactive oxygen species, which is ROS on that uh, balance. And generally these things are in balance, but what happens at these critical times like this period pre-carving is the cells produce too much reactive oxygen species and the antioxidants cannot cope. And this becomes a real challenge for the immune system. So what is involved in immunity? What can we actually do about this? And so we've got some technologies that are both new and old. Um, if we talk about the vitamins, particularly the vitamin A and vitamin E are very much involved in immunity. If we talk about the trace minerals of copper, manganese, selenium, chromium and iodine, very much involved in immunity, particularly chromium helps around trying to prevent insulin resistance. 
And then we've also got a, a new primary antioxidant called uh, under the brand name of Melafeed. Um, and what that does is uh, very quickly convert some of these uh, antioxidants into water and oxygen. So the three, the primary antioxidants of uh, Melafeed and then the secondary antioxidants of vitamin E and selenium are really there to try and protect those cells at this uh, really critical time. So if we move on to milk fever, and it's often known as the gateway disease because it's uh, cows that get milk fever are a gateway to all sorts of other diseases. And these include things like ketosis, uh, lameness, and other diseases. So if we can control milk fever to a certain extent, we can control some of these other diseases. So vets would often call it hypercalcemia. Uh, the nutritionists tend to know it as just low blood calcium. But what does it actually mean? Low blood calcium really affects the smooth muscles in the cow. Now, you might ask me, what is a smooth muscle? Well, if we take, for example, the rumen wall that we've just talked about is a smooth muscle. And so low blood calcium will affect the functioning of that smooth muscle. And if the rumen is affected, what happens is feed intake reduces. If feed intake reduces, that means energy intake reduces. And a result of that, we get things like ketosis, uh, fatty liver issues, and uh, potential reproductive issues. So very low rumen fill, and the output that the farmer might see is actually something like milk yield. The uterus is also a smooth muscle. And obviously if this uh, smooth muscle is not working right, we get something like dystocia. Dystocia is a, is a difficult carving or we might get retained fetal membranes. We get these sort of things that ends up in uh, diseases like metritis, uh, issues of uterine involution and reproductive issues. And the last smooth muscle is the teat, the teat sphincters, if they don't contract properly when we have uh, milk fever. And as a result, those bugs can enter into the teat and cause issues like mestatus. And lastly, what, what low blood calcium also does is it affects immune function, which we've already talked about, and that has issues with metritis, uterine involution, and reproductive issues. Right, so if we talk about milk fever, what can we do and what are the factors that contribute it? And it's a, it's a very multifactorial issue. And if we just talk about the 12 factors that I've got up there, the first one is the rapid change in diet. So what we want to try and do is address that issue by introducing some of those ingredients that I've talked about post-carving, we introduce them pre-carving and get that rumen, uh, rumen health and rumen function working as well as we can. Uh, secondly is stress. I've talked about stress and that may, uh, in this case, is, a lot of that is oxidative stress. So antioxidants, try to make sure that uh, we provide sufficient antioxidants at that time. Third one is dry cow minerals. So um, many of us will be starting to dry off within the next month. And uh, what we start to think about is uh, how we provide these minerals in the, in the dry period. And so if we need to get that balance of those minerals right, particularly around calcium and phosphorus, with, depending on what our winter feeds are, to make sure that uh, that, is, that is correctly done. Uh, body condition score. So ideally in a perfect world, we would like to be drying off from the body condition score we want to carve. And I appreciate that's not always possible, but that's the aim. And uh, we really don't want to be putting on more than half a body condition score over the dry period. Any more than that, then that can certainly influence uh, the effect on milk fever. Uh, DCAD, uh, so DCAD is a shortened version of dietary cation anion difference, which is the difference between the positive ions of potassium and sodium and the negative ions of chloride and sulfur. And potassium particularly has a very positive effect on DCAD and the I'll come back to this a little bit later, but the higher the decad in that uh, pre-carving feed, uh, the higher the incidence of milk fever. So we really want to try and reduce that decad number pre-carving. Uh, magnesium, we all know magnesium is important over this period and magnesium is very important in the calcium mobilization pathways um, and making the, the tissues receptive to calcium absorption. Vitamin D, I'll come a little bit back to this, but uh, often known as the sunshine vitamin, uh, often not a lot of sunshine present at that time when we got uh, cows springing. And so what we need to do is be providing some vitamin D to mobilize calcium in the body. Um, calcium and phosphorus, very important calcium and phosphorus together are the constituents of bone. 
And if we're talking about milk fever, we're talking about low blood calcium. So we need to uh, make sure calcium and phosphorus is in balance. Obviously energy intake, if there's not enough energy in the diet, that's uh, critical in terms of this period. Um, protein, we mustn't forget about protein, that we've got sufficient protein, but also not too much protein at this time. An important part with colostrum is colostrum is very, very high in calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, and sodium. So while some of that colostrum is produced just pre-carving, uh, we've got actually a lot of calcium and phosphorus actually leaving the body. And immune function, I've talked about that a little bit earlier on. All right, so in terms of vitamin D3, and, and while this is a reasonably complicated slide, the take home message from this is that vitamin D is very involved in, in, the, in how calcium is absorbed in the body. So while we have dietary calcium, which is the calcium that uh, we provide in the feed, there's also a lot of calcium and phosphorus standing in the bone. And these are either circulated through the liver into the system, or they get excreted in the milk, or get excreted through the manure. But it's very critical that we have vitamin D uh, in our pre-carving diet to make sure that calcium mobilization is, is activated. Just a question on, uh, or slide on DCAD. So what you can see here, and this is a, a very uh, simplified diagram, but as, uh, as we try and reduce the DCAD here pre-carving, uh, what we're trying to do, a lot of the pasture-based systems we have in New Zealand, and if you had, a, had an effluent paddock, the DCAD would sit up around about 600. What we're trying to do is reduce it this way, pre-carving, and we know if we can do that, we can reduce the incidence of milk fever. Once we've carved, we no longer feed this decad type diet, we then turn it on its head and it goes the other way and, and once milk production is occurring. So what is the cost of milk fever? Um, Dairy and Z's work in 2012 showed that clinical milk fever, so that's a cow we give a bag, uh, their milk production is drops by 14%. And if we have for every cow that's got milk fever, that same work showed that 10 to 15 cows in the herd will have subclinical milk fever. So those are cows that uh, are displaying uh, milk fever, but we just actually can't see it. And they reduce their milk production by 7%. And 5% of these downer cows actually never recover. So the cost of milk fever on an average farm in New Zealand, uh, where they get 5% 5, 5 clinical milk fever, so 33% subclinical, that's costing about $8,000 per 100 cows or $80 a cow. And, and, and there's some other research work that shows if they get milk fever, then they're more inclined to get these other issues like ketosis, um, lameness, some of these other issues. Now, a lot of you might be thinking, yes, I do the decant thing and I, and I add some magnesium sulfate or potentially some gypsum. And this is quite a nice slide showing that uh, you know, what happens at these different um, levels of adding different, I guess, supplements pre-carving. So if we did nothing, in this case, milk fever would be 5% um, and, and ketosis, say 5%. If we just did the anionic salt, uh, so just address the decad part of those factors, yes, we would have an impact on milk fever, but no, we would have no, issue, no impact on uh, something like ketosis. Some people may feel I'm just gonna do the rumen health and just try and uh, introduce those microbes to the new feeds. Uh, that won't have any impact really on milk fever to, to a certain extent, but will have some impacts on ketosis. And where we add the grain and the anionic salts together, uh, yes, we do get an, an impact on milk fever, and yes, we do get an impact on ketosis, but if we use a proper commercial transition supplement, which takes into all the issues around the trace minerals, the decad effect, uh, all these factors into account, then we can reduce milk fever much more considerably and we can also have a far greater impact on things like ketosis. So it's very important that we actually get best bang, by, bang for our buck by actually going for a, a commercial transition supplement. Sorry, Angela, right, the next slide is not coming on. Oh, there we go. All right, so the commercial transition supplement that Nutritech uh, has put together, which uh, Grand Corp use in their Springer feeds, you'll see that has a very uh, comprehensive list of all those factors that I've talked about. We've incorporated that into, into a supplement. So all the, the macro minerals, we're still providing some calcium, but in the form of calcium sulfate, not lime. 
uh, chromium for insulin resistance, all the trace minerals, um, particularly vitamin D, the vitamins, vitamins A, D, and E. The DCAD is really high, so that's uh, really high negative, so that when we introduce that, we can really drop that DCAD. And the ingredient that I talked about, which is the primary antioxidant, which is Melafeed, which is um, exclusive to Nutritech in New Zealand, is, is what we put into this um, commercial transition supplement. So what Nutritech developed was what we called a milk fever calculator. And this is really just taking the work from Dairy and Z and uh, putting it into a calculator to see what is this actually costing us from a farm point of view. And you can see there this, the cost of the prevention was about $13,000. And in this case, which is a live example, I only did this one last week, um, we're able to sell, save really almost $72,000. Now, bear in mind, we may not get every single milk fever ca case, but uh, if you worked on the averages that it's going to cost you between $16 and $20 a cow to treat, and um, the return, is, um, as Dairy and Z put, was $80 a cow, you're looking at roughly a four to one return. So what else can we do? I mean, there's no silver bullet in this business. And um, while well, we can develop these transition uh, supplements, it you needs to be part of a, a whole package. It needs to be part of a holistic approach to management uh, and all the things we can control. So as I talked about earlier on, high DCAD uh, and high potassium uh, feeds uh, don't help. They make milk fever a lot worse. So try and not put them on uh, Springer paddock, uh, effluent paddock, sorry. And often farmers tell me, oh, I'll give the springers the, the very best quality baleage that I have. And, and I often say that's not really what we're trying to achieve because often the best quality baleage is the stuff that's high in potassium. So try and use a more drier, poorer quality baleage, uh, obviously not no molds. So ideally try and split the mobs into early, mids and lates. Um, and uh, if you have quite extreme body condition scores, uh, try and manage those heavies and lights. Uh, try and feed the, obviously the lighter cows but more calories, try and feed the, the ones that are producing really well, feed them for production and try and keep mobs to be together where we can and keep, keep the cows with their friends. Right, so one of the other th things we can do is try and milk these colostrum mobs once a day. Now, I've done this presentation to many farmers and uh, a lot of people a bit apprehensive about that one earlier on, but I know that most people that do it don't, don't go back. Um, so you still have to milk them for the same number of days, but you only milk them once a day. And really this takes a large amount of stress off the uh, calcium mobilization because of the less colostrum. Uh, milking the heifers once a day, this is more an issue around uh, rearing, uh, and this is more really an issue around uh, reproductive performance in heifers uh, in their first lactation. So um, really that's one would only do that if, if rearing wasn't uh, up to scratch. So finally, it's, uh, it's quite a complex subject, but in many respects uh, achievable. So what are we trying to do? Let's reset the rumen microbes, uh, get that rumen function working. Uh, and there's a lot of things we can do to make that happen. Uh, let's try and get on top of these milk fever issues. Um, at the end of the day, we're trying to maximize milk production for this next lactation, and let's get them pregnant again. So specialist transition feeds need to be part of, I guess, an overall transition management program, uh, including feed post-carving. It is a really unique opportunity to make a huge difference. So, most of us for spring calving herds are coming to the end of uh, this lactation to start drying off, but I can encourage you to start uh, reviewing your transition program now, identify the issues you had this season, use this milk flavor calculator. The Nutritech um, area managers have these and are, are able to go out and, and visit you on farm and go through these numbers. Even in the virtual world, we've been able to do that. So uh, take advantage of that and, and have a look at your strategies for the next season. Alan. Thank you. We've, we've actually got a couple of questions you might like to cover. Sure. Um, I've got a question here. What type of mineral do you include in the pre-carving formula? Is it inorganic, organic? Um, depends on the uh, ingredients. Um, most of it is, the, for example, the selenium would be organic um, and the copper would be organic. So we use a combination of organic and inorganic. Uh, and for those real critical ones like selenium uh, and copper, we'd be using organic. Uh, trace minerals. 
Another question, how important is straw hay for transition period? Oh, my favorite question. Um, extremely important. I think um, at, at the end of the day, the, the rumen is a muscle. And, um, you know, it's, it's a bit like us maybe being in COVID and haven't been to the gym. Uh, those muscles aren't working so well. And the same with the rumen in that dry period, that, that rumen is really contracted. And what um, providing straw does is get an opportunity for that rumen to expand and to work. And what it also does, it actually opens up those folds uh, in the rumen to allow those rumen papillae to start developing. So um, for me, that's a, that's a critical part of the uh, transition period. Paul, another one here. That's a tricky one for you. Would you recommend feeding lime flour? Two to three months pre-carving to build calcium stores. Two to three months prior to carving. Two to three months prior to carving. I would really think you, I'd really need to know what the rest of the diet looks like. So at the end of the day, we we pretty much know what the calcium requirements are of a dry cow and, and a late lactating cow. So um, at the end of the day, we need to be feeding the cow for optimum bone health. And so feeding, if we're talking feeding lime and lac lake lactation, well, we should be feeding lime to the requirement of what's required for calcium, the calcium requirement. And the same in the dry period, um, feeding to the calcium requirement. And that may require that we feed some lime in that period. I guess one of the key things there, Alan, is if, if we've got those calcium levels up, it's going to help with um, teat closure, especially drying cows off, that type of thing, yes. getting those levels up. Correct. So another, another question here, what level of straw intake per cow pre post calving? Oh, it really depends, <laughs> again, really depends on what else is in the diet. So if this was a, a, a really high, uh, high input farmer that was feeding a lot, you could probably go for two, two, to keep two kilos of straw. Um, but if there's a lot of roughage coming from something else, uh, I would say at least half to one kilo of straw pre calving. Drama, yes. eh? Cool, look, I'm sure there's going to be a few more questions. Uh, keep from the through. If we don't get a chance to answer them, we'll definitely get that information to you. You might just want to hang on for the next slide here, Alan, because um, you might even be able to input on this. So we're just going to look at how we can look at different delivery systems for a different base farming systems. So look, if you're doing this decade and this transition feed, if you're trying to do it in an inch shed feed system, it's best suited for a rotary more from the from the aspect that you really need to have a second silo and a second delivery line. It's very difficult to try and get that to work if you're trying to feed a milking ration and a springer ration through the same thing. And the product, pellet or meal, works, works well if you can do that. So if you can't actually feed it in the shed, you can feed it in the paddock and you can simply do this by feeding a pellet underneath fence line or you can simply feed it on top of supplements out in the paddock. And if you can't get a get a meal to them, you can actually just use the Springer cow balancer. Basically, just sprinkle on top of your supplements like silage. Feed pads, it's pretty simple. You can use your um, mixer wagon or um, and blend it properly. Make sure that you're not wasting it though. You don't want to be leaving it there for the milkers to get. And vice versa, you want to make sure that the Springer cows are getting their dose and, and not getting your milkers ration with, with lime flour. If it's a... Um, Mix a wagon, just a straight feed up wagon. You can simply feed out in the bins and once again, sprinkle your um, Springer cow balancer over the top. And yep, you can use pellet or meal, very simple. I guess one of the challenges is if you haven't done this before um, and you're not quite sure how to do it, get one of us out, like NutriTech staff are well, well skilled on this as, as a um, grain corp, so we can come out, have a look at your situation, and see how we can make it nice and easy. Anything you want to add? I'll just comment on that, uh, Ken. Uh, it's obviously really important in the different systems to understand what your wastage is so that one tries to get the actual dose rate correct. So obviously if you're feeding it onto baleage uh, and uh, if it's a very high dry matter baleage uh, and you feel that someone's got, you're going to lose a bit of it, then it's uh, obviously worth um, increasing the, the dose rates to make sure that what goes down the throat is higher. So I guess just take into account and, and I and said a lot of the nutritive staff got a lot of experience in that, um, is making sure that you know, take wastage into account. So another question for you, Alan. Can you build up phosphorus levels in the cows before winter? Like if you're feeding 50% fodder beet diet for 60 days over the winter, can you pre-build up that level? 
Uh, I mean, phosphorus is a, is a is the key component of bone. So, I guess the question is, you know, do you you can't just build up those phosphorus levels in the bone and then not do anything in the dry period. Um, so, my view is to try and provide that calcium and that phosphorus together so you can form a good quality bone, but you really want to be doing that all the time. Uh, so, if you're feeding high levels of fodder beet in the uh, in the dry period, you need to be a, a, analyzing the the level of phosphorus in both the top and the bulb, remembering that most of the phosphorus sits in the in the tops. So, if for some reason you've had uh, bad weather and all the tops have gone, well, you've lost a lot of the phosphorus there. And and in in many occasions, you know, you find if you're feeding high levels of phosphorus, you may be phosphorus deficient, in which case it's worth adding a um, a phosphorus supplement uh, in that period and, and put that together with your uh, your dry cow mineral supplementation over that period but um, it's not all or nothing you can't just do everything now well you know it's uh, and we've seen this with some of um, uh, I guess bone poorer bone health in in cows that have been fed fodder beef for for many seasons and so what's the most practical, cost-effective way of getting that pea into cows when you're, when you're grazing fodder beet over the winter? Uh, there's numerous ways of doing it. I guess uh, Nugitec's probably preferred way is to do it through loose licks. Um, so if, if they go to an off-farm off system, is to provide a, a fodder beet balancer through a, through a loose lick type product where the cows can help themselves. So that's just a 200 gallon drum split in half and you, you put a salt lick in there and, and um, they help themselves and get their phosphorus intake that way. Just one last question before we move on. I've got a question here. What is the proportion forage concentrate that you recommend in this dry, the dry period? I guess they're talking about. You just repeat that question again, Kim. Which is the proportion forage slash concentrate that you recommend in this period? So he's obviously talking about the lead up period, the carving. In the, in the transition period, so those yeah. three weeks. Um, you know, you, I would say your, your, your concentrate portion can work up to 30, 30 to 40% in that period, um, but you'd probably start it off and work it up. But, um, and that's where straw can be your, the real balancer for you in that period for the forage component. Awesome, well, thanks, Ali. We'll, we'll just move on to the next section. So, um, Thank you for that. Look, we've got a couple of testimonies here. The, um, the fine print's pretty, pretty small, so if you're like me, struggling with age, you might struggle, but a couple of, couple of nice um, testimonies from down in the Naki. There's one there from Ben Johnston. He used to, was milking 420 cows in the autumn in 2018. He used his own mix of mag sulfate chloride, calcium chloride, and trace elements in a mixer wagon. But he ended up with 40 clinical cases of milk fever that season. So Grain Corp and Nutritech came to visit, convinced them to try the Springer Cow Balancer. I uh, found it a very simple way to get all the minerals just in one bag, didn't have to worry about staff measuring it, sorting it out. So 2019, down to just one case out of 420 cows, one clinical case. Love us the product and we'll keep using it. Another one there from um, Tom Stifflet. 290 cows in the spring, they had a history of milk fever cases where they'd normally get about at least 20. So they basically changed, used the Springer cow balancer down to about three cases. They've changed their diet, introduced hay. What they've found is uh, calving's been a lot simpler, a lot less dead calves, and um, mating's been a big improvement. So they're um, very, very strong advocates of changing to this transition feeding. So look, that will be circulated around. You can actually check that down the track. So look, um, I hope that what, what you've seen here, Alan has definitely um, put forward a very compelling case for transition feeding. So we thought it would be good if we could show you a real life case where good transitioning has been implemented. So we're actually gonna measure it from a couple of perspectives. We're gonna look at a production response. We're gonna look at a financial outcome. And we're also gonna look at a nutritional response, i.e. efficiency. So we're very fortunate, one of our very good clients has allowed us to drag the data off Tracker. So this is um, an actual example from a real farm. So just to give you a bit of background, this is a Waikato herd, uh, 610 cows, they're crossbreds, they're 500 kilogram live weight, 
So if we look at that graph there, you see a little light red line, that's 2015. And that light red line, if you follow it through, it's the typical production curve that the herd was having on farm. So they were doing around about 435, 4K, 440kgs a cow, which is about 87% of their live weight. Now the reason we started working with this farmer, this farm was very keen to use the tracker tools in the package to help fine tune their operation and improve their efficiencies. So they were really targeting and how do we get our cows up to doing one kg of uh, milk solids per one kg of live weight. So we've chosen the 2016 season. So that's that dark red line that you can see there. So the reason being, peak time, which is basically the end of September, we hadn't really had any involvement at that stage with the transition feeding. And we know that they'd actually had a challenge with quite a few cases of milk fever. So we were fortunate enough to be able to work alongside them from basically September on. And we've had the, the nice fortunate outcome of seeing that production lift by about 26,000 milk solids to the end of the year. So Another reason we want to use this season, when we could have picked 2015 as a base example, it'd be much more dramatic, but we've picked 2016 because we've really given the cows the best shot at getting the best possible production they can based on the level of production they had in the springtime. So really their, their production level was capped at about 480 kilos of milk solids, but as you can see, we've filled that gap and it's, it's and close to another 26,000 milk solids. So what we're going to look now at is if we can change the feeding in the spring and really get a good transition feeding happening, looking at the next slide, oops, gone too, yeah, by implementing good transition feeding, we're now actually seeing the cows milking at 2.3 milk solids. So in that previous slide, they got to two milk solids, they hold it, we held it for about nine weeks, but that was as high as they were getting. So the nice part about getting this transition working is that we've now picked up close to another 28,000 milk solids before we even get to the summer. Now I think uh, most of you have probably been in the same situation as us if you're up here in the, in the, in the Waikato in the north, that summer has been very challenging. But at Christmas time, we were staring down the barrel of hitting about 560 milk solids a cow. So what we've actually done is lifted the cap or lifted the ceiling on the potential production by getting our transition feeding working right. So let's have a look at the data. So this, this, this graph here, basically we've been able to drag the data off out of costings, which is in the back of Tracker. And so in, in costings, these farmers have been very good at recording their, their data. So they're, they're entering opening covers, residuals, the number of hectares, they're looking at any feed, they're recording it each week, according to, hey, it might be molasses, meal, paint, PK, whatever. All of those costings are going in, including the freight, minerals, additives, the works. So in the background, costings is calculating the feed conversion efficiency, calculating the margins, and most importantly, it's calculating out exactly how much feed these cows are eating. So if we look at this, this graph, it's pretty easy to, to understand what's going on. 2016, we were feeding 4.85 kilos of concentrates. So that's your molasses, palm kernel, meal, etc. 2019, we've actually increased that a little bit. So we've gone up about another 280 grams. Here's the big aha moment for us. When we pulled the start out, we're actually quite, quite staggered. When we were feeding the cows back in 2016, these guys were offering the cows as much grass as they could eat. They were very focused on pasture quality and, and residuals, but feeding them really well. When we look at the figures, we were actually only getting 14 kgs of dry matter into these cows. But the total dry matter intake, 18.85, which is around about 3.7 to 3.8% of their body weight. But look at 2019. With a good transition feed, we're actually getting another three kilos of dry matter in the way pass into these cows. So we're now actually hitting, hitting 22 kilos of dry matter. So that's a whopping 4.2% of body weight. So what we've seen is a massive improvement in 
appetite and a massive improvement in dry matter intake. So now we're milking at 2.3 milk solids compared to two. Other interesting thing, we go back to 2016, look at the price difference, price difference for feed. But the concentrated feeds were averaging out at 35 cents a kilo. Look at the price today. 53 cents a kilo, so it's a massive increase, about 14.5 cents a kilo. So effectively $145 increase per tonne. Now look, a lot of people would see that figure and say, oh, you can't make any money out of that. Well, hold your fire, let's look at the next slide. So we put all these figures into this chart, added it all up. So to be fair, we put everything on a level playing field. So we brought the pay up back to $6. So on that $6 income, you can see what you're earning in 2016, 2019, the difference is we're generating an extra dollar out of your cow. So let's look at the total cost of our feed. This includes grass being factored in there at nine cents. And just to make that level playing field consistent, I've actually used the same cost for feed from 2016 and applied it to 2019. So the reason I've done that, Basically, it shows you the increased cost from feeding another three kilos of feed and extra um, concentrate. So that, that increased cost is 35 cents per day more for the feed. So if we look at our margins now, we're making $8.91 margin over all feeds from 2016. 2019, it's $10.36. The difference is we're now generating an extra dollar forty-five on a six dollar payout. So what does that mean? If we look at the next chart down there, six hundred and ten cows generating an extra profit or margin of a dollar forty-five a cow, that's a whopping eight hundred and eighty-four dollars of profit per cow per day. Oh, sorry, per day from that, that herd. So I mean that's significant. If you think about it on a weekly basis, that's well over six thousand two hundred dollars of not not income, profit. Now I imagine there's probably a few questions coming on here uh, and uh, you're probably typing in there rapidly right now saying, well, hang on a minute. What if our payout comes back to $6 this year and we've got the high costs on top of that? So look, I've, I've worked that out. So your cost of all feeds for 2019 at $3.44 up the top there would actually increase up to $4.20. That means when we look at our margin over feed on a low payout with high cost, we've actually dropped our margin significantly. So it's gone from $1.45 down to 68 cents. But hey, that's not too bad. So we're still generating $414 worth of extra profit per day. So that's about nearly $3,000 worth of extra profit per week consistently. Now, the other question that you probably have at this stage how has that affected animal health and fertility? Um, they've just dried the, well, haven't dried the cows off, but they've just conditioned scored the cows and they're about a 4.6. If we look at the fertility, they're 7.2% empty. They do five weeks AI, six weeks natural mating, the bull's out on the 23rd of December, and the six week in calf rate's about 78%. So they're doing okay, but I believe there's a few questions come up, so we'll just have a look on here and see what we're looking at. Uh, missed some of the any questions there that we need to look at. Okay, I'll come back to that if, I, if there's any questions. Dave might want to just jump in and um and ask them. Oh yeah, you there, Kim? Yeah. Yep. Um, just a question there, Ken. Have uh, have you used uh, use recovery or protective facts in the post calving period for, for that farm? For that farm, we've actually um, we've had a little. I oh, actually, you actually did the transition feed at this time, Dave. You'd be able to answer that one. Did you have some in the in the lead up? We definitely had some bypass fat after calving. Yeah, definitely in the lead up as well, Ken, on that yeah. one. Yeah, no, that's cool. Answer that question. Anything else? And the other one, Nick, the other one we've got here was this peak intake, e.g. Four, four weeks post-calving. Um, so where they're at there. Yeah, so, okay, so I'll show you exactly what that is. So when we're looking at those figures, that was at the 8th of October. 
okay, the week of the 8th of October. So when we were comparing those figures, it was a snapshot. And just, just to clarify, this is exactly the same farm, exactly the same herd, same numbers, same calving spread, and actually the same management, same farmers on that farm. Nothing's changed. So the figures we were representing were basically on the 8th of October. So that's, so it took, actually this, this graph here will, will demonstrate this a lot better. So I don't know if anyone's seen um, this, this graph on feed conversion efficiency, but the key things, just to summarize, summarize right now, We've clearly shown the production response. So this season we're looking at probably picking up another odd 25,000 milk solids on top of that 2016 year. We've clearly shown the financial gains in a good year and even in a hard year. What we want to look at now is how well these cows are converting the feed. So this here is a graph on the left hand axis. You have grams of milk solids per kilogram of dry matter. Along the bottom axis, you see the dates. So typically, if this was live in your tracker program, you could hold your mouse over any one of those dots like we are now, and up the top springs this little box which says we're getting 104 grams of milk response from every kilo of dry matter feed. So you can do that anywhere along that graph and it's all been calculated up for you. So one of the questions that you might ask right now is, well, what should we be targeting for? Very mediocre average feed conversion efficiency is only around about 85 grams. We want to be targeting at least 100 grams for every kg of dry matter, and preferably a little bit more, maybe 107, 115 grams. Then we know a cow's working efficiently. What I want to draw your attention to on this graph is look at the slope of it. We've actually got in the springtime elevated um, milk solids from a kilogram of dry matter. So we're actually, if you look at the figures below that graph, you see 124, 115, 108. We've got very high feed conversion figures up on in the spring from calving to, to um, peak production. And then when we've got to the peak production that 8th of October, it starts dropping off. So what we're seeing here is that basically, once your cow has actually stopped mobilizing body weight, we start to see what the true feed conversion is. So we know on the 8th of October, those cows in 2016, the maximum they were eating was nearly 19 kgs of dry matter. So the question is, how could we possibly have higher milk solids responses before they got to that stage and it's a very easy question to answer it's basically body fat that's been mobilized and this is that negative energy balance that um, Alan's been talking about previously so actually just click on the button there Ange. okay so it's that elevated feed conversion leading up to peak that shows us we've got a major issue a lot of major issue it, it's basically limiting our potential. So what happens is we're using expensive energy, it might cost you 75 megajoules to put a kilogram of live weight on and you'd be lucky if you're getting 35 megajoules back at this time. But the more expensive part is the impact, the negative impact that it's going to have on the liver. So the greater the weight loss, the more you compromise the integrity of the liver. So as I mentioned, at week three of October, we're sitting at around about 87, 86 grams per kilo dry matter. That's, and from there on in, we're seeing it typically just sliding away. Next, next button. Yep. So we've restricted our peak here. So this is really interesting. Quite often you see cases of this where guys have got up to the stage where they're peaking, grass is taken off, they open the cows up and they're wondering why these cows aren't lifting. Why can't we get them up? We've already kept the production for the rest of the year because we've, we've compromised the integrity of the liver. Next one, poor feed conversion. We're basically seeing that feed conversion decline right through for the rest of the season, we're limited. We've kept that selling, and, and that's classic. If you look at 2016, the, the most we could get the cows to with a poor transition would be around about 480 milk solids. And the key one is we've lost valuable body condition. 
So let's have a look at a, at a good example now of good transition feeding. So this is 2019. What you notice here is a completely different graph. You'll see that starting in the spring and working our way through, we've got a gradual increase all the way through. And our, and our levels are very level. We're sitting just over 100 all the way through. So typically, we could clearly say we haven't lost all that weight in the spring now. When we get to our peak production, we don't have a drop off. We're still sitting up at 103, 107, 103, 116. So we've got a key thing is we've stimulated our, our um, appetite. Let's bring those slides up as we go through. Massive improvement in appetite. Huge increase in our dry matter intake. Body condition loss has been kept to absolute minimal. Next one, feed conversion efficiency is consistent and it's climbing. And we've lifted our peak production potential and we've improved our margins. So this is what we really wanna be looking for after you've had good transition period. It's not just that, but that's, those are the key things. So look, that's pretty much our example. We might have a few more questions, but I'd like to finish with this. Imagine you're leaning on the boundary fence and you're having a chat to your neighbour. Hopefully it's not two metres away and we're back to normal again. And um, you find out that this guy's doing 2.4 milk solids, same sort of system as you, and you're only doing two kilos. Do you ask him what he's feeding? Or do you actually ask him, hey, how did you transition your cows? It's the attention to detail on a regular basis that makes a massive difference, but it's knowing what to do at the right time that cements it all together. So what I would recommend from here is that if you have actually got a case on your farm where metabolic problems have been an issue, get your nutri track and your grain cook guide there. We can look at it and see how we can sort things out. If you want to take your farm to another level and you like to make it more efficient, I can't recommend enough getting on Tracker so we can see how that we can possibly help you. Look, that's pretty much it for me. I'll just check to see if we've got any other questions that need answering. Is it okay to add lip PK immediately after carving onwards to minimise body condition loss? Look, the, the biggest thing with stopping body weight loss is to get that cow functioning, the rumen functioning before she actually carves. So if you haven't developed the rumen like um, Alan's alluded to, you can offer that cow as much as they like and you can't get those levels up. So definitely no harm in ad living palm kernel once they've carved, but you also need to keep in mind who, what dairy company you're with as far as FEIs go. Um, but look, there are, there's just a couple of things I'd like to cover before we... Um... You know, just got one more uh, question there. Maybe it's this one's for, for Alan. Yep. Um, how can you get more energy into a cow in spring when she is eating close to her maximum volume? Is, it, is, is that, and then just another part to it, is that a good time to be adding bypass fats or, or molasses? Or, or should we be waiting until mating? Um, there's some really nice research work on this uh, that shows the, the effect of body condition loss uh, in early lactation on that follicle that we're going to try and mate on the third heat. So uh, my recommendation would be to try and, if you really are, if you've got really high, uh, sorry, low dry matter pasture, for example, that you feed in the, in the, and you maxed out in terms of, of I guess, room and fill or room and weight, the dry matter intake, or, in, or fresh weight intake, shall I say, then you really need to be looking for ingredients that are very high in um, energy per kilogram of dry matter. And that's when you start focusing on things like bypass fats um, to actually provide that energy in that period to minimize that body condition loss. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're talking about mating, then uh, I mean, you really want to reduce that bottom of that curve. The body condition loss is going to happen because that's hormonally driven. But it, as Ken said earlier on, it's um, the effect that he's seen on that farm is just that it's it's been really really low. But if you if you if you haven't done anything and you need to turn the corner, then and and mating is coming in two or three weeks time, then you really want to be putting in some bypass fats at that point. So 
my recommendation would be to do it right from the start, but it really depends on all the ingredients that you've got available and, and I guess the type of pasture you've got available at the time. No further questions, Dave? All good? No, that looks to be it, Kim, at this stage, and Ellen, thank you. Oh, look, thank you everyone for coming on. Just, just the point that there's apparently a few people who had trouble getting on the link tonight. So we will circulate this link and um, also post a link on the Facebook page. Um, encourage you to get us out there and see if we can help you. I know Alan's team are very keen to get out there and work with you as well. Uh, once again, if, if we have missed any questions, we'll follow up with that. But thank you very much for your attendance. And if there's no further questions, thank you very much, Alan. Much appreciate your input. It's been brilliant. And uh, we look forward to our um, next webinar. Thanks, everybody. Cheers.